I think in the simplest terms, we work like a CPA or we work like a lawyer where, yeah, you pay us for advice and you can trust that the advice that we're giving you, whether it's to get this investment or go buy life insurance, we're not making a commission or any other compensation on that advice. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you smash that like button and click subscribe. For those of you listening on a podcast platform, be sure to subscribe on whatever platform that is and leave us a rating if you can. The more likes, ratings, and subscriptions that we get, the more we can spread the message and grow our community. So we also have a free Facebook group. It's called The Average Joe Finances Network. Check us out, join the group, join the community, ask questions, and become a part of the team. All of our other social media accounts are listed in our flow page, and we have them in the video or podcast description below. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Welcome back to the Average Joe Finances Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Cavagioni, and today's guest is Eric Simonson. And Eric is a certified financial planner with over a decade of industry experience. I'm not going to go too far into his background because we're going to talk about that here on the show today. Eric, I really appreciate you taking the time to have this chat with me. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, first question I want to ask is the same question I ask every guest that comes on this show. And we want to know about you and your story. So if you could share a little bit about yourself, tell us how you got started. Why did you become a financial planner? Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. I actually was a English major in college, a big fan of music, writing, literature. And my then girlfriend at the time, now wife, was basically like, this is not going to work for me. We can't just have an English degree. So she prodded me to get a business degree of some sort. So I went into finance and my mom picked that up and saw that I was doing that. So she actually hooked me up with an internship with her financial advisor. So I did that for a summer and really liked it. I was mentored by someone there who told me that financial advising, financial party was one of those few industries where you can, number one, control your income. Number two, you can control the time you spend at it. And then number three, you really truly have the ability to change someone's life and make a difference in their life. And as a 22 year old, that all of a sudden breaks me. So I went ahead and applied for a full-time position with a different firm. I got hired as, a, as part of a, a financial planning practice with uh, a big broker dealer here in Twin Cities, Minnesota, and really worked my way up. Went from an unlicensed assistant to a licensed assistant to a associate financial planner as well full-time financial planner and eventually to a partner in this firm. We grew quite large. I managed a big team of four advisors, 10 staff, and life was good. Life was wonderful. Great team, good money. But ultimately, I looked around, and this was 2019. I looked around, and I just I saw the rise of low-cost investing really blossom, right? With zero-cost ETFs and obviously Vanguard doing great things and Fidelity. And I wanted to be able to tell my clients like, hey, don't invest your money with me and pay one to 2% a year. Instead, just go to Vanguard, go to Fidelity, buy the index, because truthfully, that's likely going to perform better over time than these expensive investment products. But I couldn't do that. It, I was not allowed to just do that at my broker dealer. And that to me felt like a missed opportunity. And so I decided to carve out a niche in our industry and start a firm where we did just that. We, we do comprehensive financial planning because that still is really important for people to have access to. But instead of managing their investments and charging a ridiculous amount for that, we give them guidance to go on, on their own and buy a diversified portfolio of low cost indexes, which saves them a ton of money over time. I started that about two years ago, fall of 2019, two and a half years ago. And that's been a wild ride. We've really been growing like crazy and it's just accelerating here kind of month over month. So I think that we're onto something with the idea and I'm just happy to spread, spread the word and hopefully get the message out that there's other ways to get financial planning advice other than paying expensive fees. 
Yeah, no, that's awesome. So you pretty much switched yourself from being a commission-based planner and advisor to being more of a pay for the actual time that you're using us. So more of a fee-based, just based on the time that somebody's actually sitting down, chatting with you, and you're going over their plan with them, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I think the terminology in our industry is just bonkers, fee-based, fee-only. It's so hard for the average consumer to dial down what it all means. But I think in the simplest terms, we work like a CPA or we work like a lawyer where, yeah, you pay us for advice and you can trust that the advice that we're giving you, whether it's to get this investment or go buy life insurance, we're not making a commission or any other compensation on that advice. Right. There's no incentive for you to try to steer them towards something. Exactly. But you're right, though. The way it's the whole naming convention, right? In the industry itself, how it's, you say it's fee based. And that can be a little intimidating to somebody that's coming and they want to look at what you're offering for plans, advice, and everything. And you tell them, hey, we're fee based, right? And they're thinking, oh, I got to pay all these fees and this and that. But what they don't realize is you're paying a lot less because you're paying for that time versus paying over the lifetime of whatever product it is that the advisor gave you. I don't think people really, I think that's one of the things that we, the messaging needs to be out there that it's yeah. just because it's fee-based doesn't mean you're paying like more fees. It means you're paying a flat rate. So what's so interesting is even at my broker dealer where we charge a, a assets and management fee, we also sold insurance and sold annuities we were legally allowed to call ourselves fee-based at that time. And we still, we still would be. And so my understanding is the term fee-based really doesn't have much basis other than they're paid through fees generated by a product sale. And then down and down a little bit further, we're fee only, which basically then strips the commission of insurance and annuity sales, but they still make a percentage of the account value. Where I think we fall and the, kind of the, the new term that people are adopting is advice only, where we just give advice and there's really no fees associated with the advice we give other than that. They agreed upon either retainer or the hourly or the consulting fee. Okay. No, definitely. I, I wrote that down because the, I think that's the first time I actually heard it called advice only versus like fee only and stuff. Because I've talked to a couple, a couple other financial advisors that did the same thing. They made that switch from being at like a, a larger firm where they're getting their commissions based off of the products that they sold. And they switched to, hey, we're only charging for the time that you're with us as we're giving you these consultations and helping you build your plan. And they all called it fee only. That's been ingrained in my head. So I understood it that way. But I think I like this better advice only, or, Hey, only a retainer. You're only yeah. paying a retainer. Not it's the same thing. Like you said, like as a lawyer, right? Yeah. Yeah. Fee, most fee only advisors, the majority of fee only advisors still manage assets and charge a percentage for that. And if they're not doing that, that's where that's truly where they become more advice only. Okay. Yeah. Right on. Okay. I want to dive a little bit into your story, right? So you started off as an assistant, a non-licensed assistant working at a firm. And you worked yourself up to where you were running a team where you had several other advisors under you. And there was something like while you were doing that, you realized you're talking with your clients and you say, I really want to tell them to just go buy this ETF instead, but I can't because I'm bound by my organization to push their products and everything because that's how we get paid. If you're not doing that, you're not going to get paid. You're essentially giving them free advice at that point. Yeah. But so you were like, okay, something's got to change. Something's got to give. And that's when you decided, hey, I'm going to walk away and, and do my own thing, start my own thing. So I guess my curiosity is what happened when you decided to walk away and start your own business and start your own financial advising business? Was it difficult to start? Was it something that you found easy because you were able to bring some clients with you? Like, how did that work? Yeah, great question. It, it was incredibly difficult, earning a great income to zero and Right. There's a lot of administrative work involved with getting set up as an independent registered investment advisor business. And I couldn't take any clients with me. I worked with 150 amazing clients and minus a few friends and family. Really, I had to leave all of them there. And so you're starting from basically zero. But what I found was when I started to lead more with my ethics and my beliefs, there was just that thing energy for me around that. And I think that people could see that 
And so it was a lot easier for me for sure to attract new clients and talk to people about what I'm doing and have excitement around what I was doing because I believed in it so much. I think I was energized despite the level of work and despite the lack of income, just energized that I was followed by my moral compass and beliefs. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. One of the one of the words I wrote down as you were talking about this is just genuine, right? You by being able to do this and following your own morals and your own ethics, you were able to really show prospective clients how genuine you are, right? And that you genuinely want to help them. And that's the whole reason why you walked away from where you were at. That's fantastic. The other thing I wrote down is how, you know, yeah, it definitely sounds like it was incredibly difficult because you walked away from a spot where you had, you said, what, 150 clients to having now zero, a big fat donut. So you went from having this steady income to starting from scratch with nothing. And I can only imagine how stressful that must have been. But it's good that you were able to get yourself to a point where you can walk away and start your own business. So that's amazing. Now, yes, yeah, go ahead. one thing I should ask that too is that for me, not only was the income piece so difficult, I'm a relationship guy and I love to all the clients that I worked with. And so it, to me, it honestly felt like breaking up with 150 people and say, hey, it's not you, it's me. And that was <laughs> so hard for me. That was soul sucking for the course of, yeah, six months to just have those conversations day, day in and day out. Yeah, I, I didn't even think about that. That's That cannot be easy, right? Yeah. You have 150 people that, that you got close with because you're helping them build their plans. You're helping them build their future and build their financial future. And of course, there's going to be a relationship there because you get to know these people. You get to know about them and their families, their why, their reason why they're doing what they're doing. And then you're like, hey, adios. Yeah, See ya. Yes. Um, Some of them I worked with for as long as a decade, 10 years. And, wow. and then, of course, then after I leave, I, I still have to say no. I can say, I have not compete. I can't work with you. And that's also hard. So it's just a tough situation, but make it the best of it and understand the business side of it and why everything is how it is. No, that's definitely understandable. Ah, that's that's tough. That's real tough, man. So even as a, so me, I'm a realtor on the side too. So if I decided to change brokerages, any clients that I'm working with at that time, that that will all still go through the old brokerage. But right. I can, if I go to the new brokerage and then that same client wants to sell their home later on or anything else like that, I could still have that relationship. So it's a little bit different from that side where you just completely have to break things off. Yeah. Delete my number from your phone. Oh no. Block yeah. me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's rough. Okay. Ah, oh, man. All right. Okay. Moving on from the pain. You're at a point now where you, you said your business is growing, it's expanding. And as you're doing this, you have your own financial journey that you're on as well. So what is it for you? This is more of a personal question. So what is it that you're doing for yourself on your own journey in financial freedom? What is it that I'm doing for myself and my own journey? So my business it, in a lot of ways is that thing that I'm doing for myself because I look at the fact that, hey, the quicker I can get my business to a point where I have a team of advisors working with me, and if I can peel off a profit from those advisors, then that is, that's my passive income. Right. That's your right. rental properties where, hey, I don't have to necessarily be working day in and day out, but I'm still generating some revenue for my team. And so that's what motivates me is just, hey, how do I build not only an asset, but also a profitable, a cash flow producing investment here that will help me get by. Okay, hey, right on. Now, we didn't talk about this, at least on the air, but I know like from your background, this, you started this back in 2019, right? When you started this, there was no, COVID, there was no pandemic, there was none of that going on. So what was the impact when, especially since you were fresh, right? You had just walked away, you just started this business and then the pandemic happened. So how did that impact you? Yeah, COVID, COVID, COVID's been horrific for so many reasons, but as far as COVID affected my business, it was a good thing because I was doing all virtual meetings from the get-go. I was 100% virtual, only amount of people via web meetings because I wanted to sort of households all over the country. I didn't want to just be limited to my region in Minnesota here. And so initially there was some hesitancy to that. If people wanted to work with me and I would say, hey, great, I'll set up the Zoom link to do that. They would say, no, I want to meet in person. And the pandemic really shifted that narrative. So now everybody is comfortable with it. Everybody knows how to log into Zoom. They know how to share documents. They want to share their screen. And so in, in some ways it just made what I was trying to do a lot easier. Yeah. And by by making yourself available like that, pretty much all over the United States, right? Like nationwide, you're yeah. now you're now at a point where you have much more reach than if you just stayed in a local area. 
Whereas before, the firm you were tied to, I'm sure every, everybody there was local. Like they had to come into the office and do everything. So you have, you definitely have a lot more reach and you can impact a lot more lives, which is fantastic. Oh. Now, I would ask you normally how long you've been doing this, but so I know you, you just started this in 2019, but how long have you been a financial planner? Since 2009. So 13 okay. years. Okay. Yeah. So you did 10 years doing it at the firm and then switching over now. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. Now, exactly. I'm pretty sure I know the answer to this one, but I want to ask it anyway. But can you tell me what you enjoy the most about what you do on your day-to-day -day job as a financial planner? What I enjoy the most about my day-to-day, -day, I love being part of a team. I love managing people. I'm one of those weird people that actually really enjoys like managing people, hiring people, and leading people. I get energized by team meetings. I get energized by project planning with my team. So that that's probably what I truly actually enjoy the most. Separate from that, one of the things that we advise our clients on that is a little bit unique is in addition to just regular comprehensive financial planning, we also talk to our clients about travel kind of travel hacking and ways to get cheap flights and just leverage hotel miles or hotel points and airline miles and other points. And that's more of a hobby. That's a passion of mine. I enjoy having those conversations with clients quite a bit. No, that's awesome. I, actually, I'm glad you brought that up. I want to talk a little bit about travel hacking. Could you explain what that is? Yeah, travel hacking is a broad term, but it essentially it refers to using credit card points as currency and making those points stretch as humanly possible or humanly far as possible figuring out all the intricacies of what's the best credit card to have, how do those points work, how do the credit card benefits work that can help you get you know, better or cheaper travel experiences, what are different sweet spots in airline award charts where I can use my points with them and fly further for cheaper. Essentially, that's the game. Yeah, I've heard recently, especially like on, on TikTok and stuff and some of these other social media channels where there's people talking about travel hacking in general. And one of the things they're talking about is like the right time to buy your tickets for a flight. So I keep getting confused because I was always told it's six weeks out. That's the time. And now I'm hearing 28 to 38 days out. So when's the best time to buy a ticket? And I was also, I also heard that Tuesday's the best day to buy a ticket after I think, I think it's like after 8 AM on Tuesday morning. So what, yeah. I can, the Tuesday thing is a myth for sure. I know that's okay. a fact. The Tuesday <laughs> thing is a myth. So if you're talking about booking a cash ticket, which again, I, most of the time I'm trying to live in the world of free flights with points, but okay. if you're trying to buy a cash ticket, I found that it's very simple. So like about 60 to 90 days out in the winter is a great time to book a, a flight. So for example, I'm usually looking like early to mid November for flights in Hawaii or Costa Rica or Belize for January, February. Almost okay. always you can get great deals about six, six weeks out there. But if you're thinking like summer travel or spring break travel or any holiday travel, that's going to vary more wildly. And there, I think you're going to actually have better luck if you narrow it in a bit more. Yeah, to your point, the 30 days would be probably more likely to get a better price than say five months out. Okay, right on. You know, I also heard that flying overseas or anything like that is also, it's better to do it three months plus out for overseas tickets. So I don't that, know. <laughs> no, I, that, that's not been my experience. I, I look at flights all the time for people. It varies wildly, but you can always find good deals for 16 to 20 days out. Right on. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit more about travel hacking though. So when you're talking about your focus is on getting the free flights, it's not about getting the the best price because you're focused more on using your points as currency, like you said, right? Yeah. Now, does it make a difference when you book with points or is it always going to be the same no matter when you book it? Yeah, no, it, it makes a difference. So if you're going to book a nice flight, so if you're going to use your points for first class flight, but international first class or a business class flight, typically with those, there's a lot of competition for them. So really you want to book those out as far in advance as you can. And my wife and I, we flew to Singapore on Singapore suites a few years back. And I remember we had to book that like 361 days or something like that in advance with an hour window when those awards got loaded up in their system, otherwise they got snagged up. So, right, it's going to vary wildly depending on what flight you want to go on, what cabin you want to sit in. And we're trying to, so what we're doing is we're building out a ton of resources for our clients to build knowledge around that. So they're not just relying on us to tell them what to do, but they're actually being taught and they're learning, okay, this is how I use my points. This is how I find flights. These are the different 
partners that I should transfer my points to for the best value. Okay. What do you think are the best credit cards for airline points? It's going to depend. It depends on your spending. Are you spending money a lot on groceries? Are you spending money on dining out? Are you buy, Are you shopping? Are you online shopping? Are you going to Amazon? Are you going to Target? It's going to mm-hmm. vary, but typically, right, some of the best starter cards that just work for a lot of people is like the Chase App or Verge. That's a very common. I've heard that one a lot. Yeah. Widely, you know, widely accepted one. And then a new one that a lot of people like to is the Capital One Venture X card. That one's maybe not quite a starter card, but it's one of the first few cards you want to get. Okay. Yeah. I'm a big Amex Platinum user. So that's oh, the card okay. I pretty much use for everything. And there's a lot of times where like you, when you book stuff with them, you get five times points and everything yeah. like that. So, yeah, yeah. So Amex Platinum is a good card, but this new Capital One Venture X card is, it's being called like the Platinum Killer. Because oh, wow. it's a much lower annual fee and you get like 10 points per dollar on hotels and car rentals. And I think you get five points per dollar on those flights. Wow. Um, okay. And they've got some other really cool deals. You do, well, you don't get those. You don't get that lounge access quite as, as well as you do with that platinum card. There's a lot more platinum lounges than there are capital one lounges. So far. Okay. No, that's definitely one to look at then because so right now my annual fee gets waived while I'm still active duty in the Navy. Wow. So that's fine. However, in the future, when I'm no longer in active duty in the Navy, the capital one Venture X might be a good option to look yeah. at. It's a good card. I just picked it up. And the other cool thing about that card is you get two points per dollar of everything. So oh, wow. if, with the platinum, you're just basically getting one on everything besides, like you said, flights. Yeah, unless it's like on certain deals that they have going on. Yeah, yeah. So it's, hey, 200% more point accrual. That's a good thing. Do they have a flight credit too on that card? They do right now. Yeah, they do okay. right now. But I think they're just trying to get people in the door because it's a new card. Yeah. So I don't know if that will always continue. Yeah, Amex changed theirs. It used to be like $200 towards any airline. And now it's like towards incidental fees. So if you spend money on that airline, if you buy drinks or food and stuff or extra baggage fees, yeah, that gets covered by it now where it used to just, they would take 200 off the ticket. Yeah, they don't do that no more. I have seen examples, but it's rare where you can use that credit for upgrades, but it depends on how that airline codes it. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, they. when I was talking with them on the phone, they didn't, they didn't really mention that. But because I had switched everything over because we we're taking a big trip later this year to Florida from Hawaii, but we want a direct flight. So we're not like connecting in the airport and being around a whole bunch of other people and everything. We asked, hey, can we use that if we wanted to upgrade anything on the flight? And they said, no, normally it's going to be for just food and baggage fees and things like that. So we were like, ah, okay, that's fine. Yeah. I mean, because we're going to wind up paying baggage fees anyway because we're going to have extra stuff yeah. because we're going back to the mainland. So we have to make a trade. Trader Joe's trip. So we're going to have a suitcase just for Trader Joe's to load that sucker up and bring it back because we don't have one of those out here in Hawaii. Yeah. So yeah, it's it, their Trader Joe's is too cheap. They, they won't allow that in Hawaii. And I have to get your uh, three buck chop and buy the truck load. Yeah, out. for sure. I, I appreciate you taking some time to talk with me about some travel hacking it's off topic, but on topic for what we're talking about. But yeah, this is all really good stuff, man. I want to go into this, uh, this new thing that I started. I call it the final round where it's going to ask you four questions that are just hit, 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 and we blast the room. Okay. But they're really, uh, they're, they're good questions. I like sure. them. I like yeah. asking these questions, get some good responses out of this. So if you're ready, we'll get this started. Get me. I'm ready. Okay, let's go. All right, first question. It's a doozy. What's the biggest mistake you've ever made? Biggest mistake I personally ever made? Yes. All right, that is a hard one. I usually don't try to, I live with no regrets. I try to not to Not even mistake. a single letter? Meet I the Miller's know. reference. I've seen that movie, but I'm terrible at movie like reflections. I've seen yeah, it the, twice. You remember the guy with the neck tattoo? Yeah. The no regrets? Oh, yes, I do know that. That's what, know that. Yeah. Perfect. Gosh, probably not starting my business sooner. Really, I do think about that. I think that I'm glad I started when I did, but there was an opportunity to start earlier and that would have been a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, because you were at your previous place for 10 years, so right. that's, that's a lot of time doing that. But it's Everything happens for a reason. You got some really good experience there. That's, uh, hey, yeah, sure, you could have started earlier, but you started when you started, and now it's taken off, so that's, that's and, well done. Yeah, exactly. I got a great team and a wonderful growing business, so all is good. Awesome. Okay, here's the next one. What is something that you've learned that you wish you knew when you first started? Most people, most people go to finance and financial planning, financial advising, they think that they need to be good with money and numbers and accounting. And really that does not have really any bearing on your success in this industry. So I think what I would have preferred to know sooner was just, hey, 
in order to be successful in financial planning, you should just be a good people person, like under, have empathy, like read the room, understand people's emotions. You're going to be a much, much better at your job if you do that. And I think it took me a long time to realize. That's awesome. That, I really like that. Awesome, man. Okay, cool. Now, next question. Do you have any tips or tricks that you would recommend to someone that is just getting started today? Just getting started in their like financial independence journey. They're coming to meet you for their first meeting and they say, hey, I want to start building my wealth. I want to start investing. What kind of tips or tricks would you recommend to them as they're getting started? Yeah, I think first thing we on style the budget. Let's see exactly where you're spending, how much you're spending. Let's figure out, is there anything you can cut back on? Let's talk about it. Is that spending in alignment with your values? Are you happy with where you're spending money? And then from there, right, do they have the right level of cash reserves? Do they have any debt that we should be trying to tackle? Those are really the immediate things. Make each other save them to the 401k if they get cash, stuff like that. Okay, awesome, awesome. All right, and the last question of the final round is, do you have a favorite business, investing, or real estate-related book or podcast or both? The Average Show Finances podcast. Oh, come on. I appreciate uh, that. Yeah, I, it's kind of resource is what you're saying. I really like, and I, this is a blog, but I really like my money blog. I don't know if you've heard of that. Okay, um, yeah, yeah. Been around for, I don't know, 15 years or something. And he does such a good job of just listing, here's the best bank accounts that have a high interest which is something that I value a lot because I try to help my client, clients find the highest interest savings accounts. He lists the best 0% balance transfer cards. Just lots of neat, cool stuff that he does and he's been doing it for a long time. And there's not a ton of junk on there. And I like it. Yeah, no, it's good stuff. Like him and the points guy. They're, those are like two ones that you can really get a lot of good info from. Awesome. The points guy. Yeah, the points guy is the one everybody goes to for points. Yeah. yeah I brought that up because we talked about travel. <laughs> yeah, it's a points guy. I think what it's, it's just getting to be a little too big. There's just so much going on there. It's not a great place, I think, to kind of start. But if somebody is looking for a good travel hockey blog, the frequent miler is awesome. Yeah, the yeah. miler is really good on view from a wing. The one mile at a time, those are three good ones. Okay. No, I haven't seen that one. So yeah, I'll check that out for sure. Awesome. Okay. So that's it for the final round, but I do have one more question for you, Eric, and this is probably the most important one of all, because there's folks that are listening to the show right now and they're saying, Hey, I really like what Eric did with the way he started his business and just how genuine of a financial planner that he is. And maybe I want to work with Eric and his team. So where can people find you? Where do you have a website you can share with us? Any social media, anything like that, that you could share with our listeners? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for asking that. And I was excited to be on this podcast. One thing we didn't talk about is just how we're trying to serve the average show. Love it. Where we don't have minimums like all financial lines we really do these days. We are at a price point that I think is extremely accessible for a lot of people. And we're also trying to keep, keep getting that lower and lower to serve more and more people. So if somebody wants to just go check out what we're doing and see if it's a good fit, they can go to our website which is www.abundowealth.com. And then we're on all the social media platforms under that same. Awesome. Hey, so we will make sure that we have all the links in the bio, well, down below. So to make it easy for everybody, you can find it in the show notes. You'll be able to find Eric's website and all of his social media profiles for him and his team. And uh, just to make it easy for you. So if you're driving your car right now, don't sit here and try to type it in or copy it down or whatever. It's going to be in the show notes, going to make it easy for you. But yeah, fantastic. Eric, this awesome. I'm really excited for you and what you're doing. I'm really excited that I had a chance to talk to you today and even touching some things outside of what you do as a planner and talking about some travel hacking stuff. That was pretty fun. And, uh, and I learned some more and I've got two new blogs I need to check out for sure. So definitely appreciate that. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it's been a blast and aloha from Hawaii. Thank you for making it to the end of this episode. Greatly appreciate you being here with me today on the Average Joe Finances podcast. If you haven't done so yet, make this the episode that you go leave us a five-star rating or subscribe to our YouTube channel. The Average Joe Finances podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only. Have an outstanding day. Mm -hmm.